ставимых два. Next we have Oleg. Rebecca next. Hello. And lastly. Hi, Tony here. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. Good. <laughs> Thank Where you are you so right now? Are you in public? You're wearing a mask. <laughs> yeah, I'm in the office, actually. I'm uh, in Louisville, Kentucky. But... Whoa, wait. How, how did you end up in Kentucky? I'm in Louisville, Kentucky. <laughs> hello, hello. How's it going, Tony? Good. By the way, thank you. Uh, thank you guys for putting this together. I'm really excited about this conversation. So, of course, thanks for joining us. Yeah. What about you? Where are you currently based? Yeah. So, I guess remotely based in the mm -hmm. Bay Area normally, um, but oh. I'm currently in Portland, Oregon. Oh, okay. Yeah. And yourself? Uh, I'm in New York. Awesome. I'm, in New York. Nice. Um, nice. I'm usually between New York and Boston. Um, I mean, it wasn't for the pandemic. And then also, I realized unfortunately about a month ago that my passport had expired my Nigerian passport. <laughs> um, so I had to go through the entire process of renewing my passport, should be receiving it in a few weeks. I mean, otherwise, you know, I, I would love to, I would prefer to do this in Lagos. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm planning on actually moving back, you know, to Lagos, you know, potentially even permanently, um, you know, I, 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 as soon as, you know, uh, possible basically, so. That's awesome. What, what inspired that through the pandemic? Was it just chaos or? <laughs> you know, that's a great question. Um, I mean, so I, this was something that I think has always been in the back of the mind, um, you know, wanting to reorient my, you know, my professional career back to the continent. But I mean, I think 2020, you know, just like, you know, the, the catalog of events that happened um, in many ways just made it or made, you know, myself and my partner, you know, Jay Freeman realize that, you know, this is probably, you know, the best time in terms of timing for us to do this. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, whether it was with the pandemic and how it basically closed to us, you know, just how, um, uh, you know, the, the unequal distribution in many ways of capital around the world. Um, and then you even connected to that, you know, you know, BLM here in the United States and how that ultimately spread across the world, right? Like, you know, so I mean, this topic that we're ultimately, you know, discussing here is like, you know, near and dear to, you know, to us. Um, and basically made us like, you know, just get off our, you know, comfortable butts here in the, here in the US and say, listen, like, we can't stop, we need to stop making excuses and we actually need to, you know, do this in a meaningful way. Like, you know, we have been blessed with just so many you know, advantages, talents, experiences, you know, and, and this is what we ultimately want to do. So we need to stop making excuses and just go for it. That's awesome. Um, and Bram, I was going to say that, uh, so I think how we should start is that I'm going to say, hey, welcome to have your hair. I'm Claudia Durley. Um, Then you're going to take over. Okay, cool. Then until the question part, I'll then take over. Totally, totally. So this is the, the second round that you guys are doing. Um, mm -hmm. I'm kind of curious, where were some of the main takeaways from the first one? Because I mean, uh, I, I would hope that we're not, you know, ultimately touching on, you know, old territory through this session, right? Uh, no, 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 not really, because in the old one, we kind of mainly focused on race. So mm -hmm. this time I tried to bring about, you know, like which we tried to bring about like language as well as gender. And mm -hmm. um, what I would hope you focus on is that gender aspect of it as well. Um, Cause in the last one, most of our questions, some of the questions, the first ones about, the first category we're gonna be looking at is about race. So um, the questions are sort of, most of them are, let me see, not most of them. Uh, the first, yeah, the first two are repeated from the last mm -hmm. one. Um, just cause I thought they were even more important to repeat in this uh, round. Uh, most of the takeaways were, you know, um, basically the strengths that, you know, like local founders have in addition to that, you know, like what might be some of the problems facing uh, the ecosystem, you know, why that funding gap is so large. Um, but I also felt that some of the points we, that the former group pointed, uh, so 
pinpoints that we didn't really talk about them. So for example, in the former group in round one, um, someone mentioned part of the reasons why that this bias is existing in the landscape is because of you know a lack of uh, black capital stacks or lack of black LPs uh, yeah. that invest in early stage rounds. In addition to that, they also mentioned you know like a dearth of black decision makers. And mm-hmm. although like that was mentioned, it wasn't really touched or you know spoken about. So um, I added one or two questions to address. We added one or two questions to address that in the fourth slide. Okay. Yeah, and I think a, a couple of other dynamics that we that were addressed but not necessarily deep dived into were uh, like ha- building your cap table um, and mm-hmm. kind of the representation around that, um, and then prospecting companies um, and how I guess gender and race influence you know the companies that are coming in, and then I think a s- underlying uh, factor that was um, pretty much throughout the conversation was essentially like cold calls or cold emails and, mm-hmm. you know, deal flow within that, that realm. So I'd be interested to hear your perspective on that. Um, but beyond that, I think we're trying to keep it open and really expound on a lot of the topics that we touched upon in the first round. So, yeah. All right, perfect. I'm really looking forward to this. Thank you. Thank awesome. you. So are we. <laughs> Um, I am curious, how did you guys go about selecting, you know, the speakers? I, 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 you know, first of all, kudos to you guys. I mean, not only this session, but then the session before, you know, you guys have had really strong, um, you know, perspectives, I will say. So, I mean, I'm kind of curious, like, how did you guys go th- through, like, you know, picking the right voices? I mean, geez, like, you know, at least all the people in, within, you know, my immediate network, you know, in, in the VC industry, I mean, like, we're all having these conversations privately, right? Like, right. <laughs> so, I mean, you, you guys, you guys could pick basically anyone to ultimately, you know, sit and pontificate on like, you know, their ideas of why, you know, bias exists. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Totally. So, yeah, I think for this round, our first round, we had a lot of Nigerians. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, Nigerian bias. That, yeah. And although that's great, really, you know, like I myself being Nigerian, we thought we diversify a bit more, look for people who were mm-hmm. Nigerian. But I think two or if not three of you are Nigerian, which we didn't do that great of a job. Because well, our last my, my name sounds neutral enough, so you don't have to call me. <laughs> <that. laughs> <laughs> yeah so i mean unless if you want me to go by lua tony campbell then uh, yeah, I can do that too. <laughs> just ask me which one you want me to you know which which persona you, I, I can turn on for you uh, any any is great any persona okay. is great and thanks for being early by the way we, we no, really no. appreciate no, that. i mean i always like just jumping in early at least you know so it's not like cold start you know what i mean right totally, <laughs> um, totally. you know get a little loose um you know and then actually have you know, something that you know looks and feels like you know we're just having a coffee chat or something like that you know yeah absolutely yeah. definitely definitely uh Ibrahim, oh, cool. can you do i like start recording from my end or is, is that i think I it's already recording. recording yeah it's recording now okay yeah. okay okay so uh, uh I, I i hope that you guys cut some of this <laughs> yeah <laughs> totally <laughs> yeah we we are definitely going to i mean unless that. like you know hi everybody like you know thank you for listening to this <laughs> jam right now. oh no we're definitely, this, going to cut. Right. Yeah, we're definitely right. going to cut it the last time um we made a mistake of not cut not recording so we couldn't share out afterwards yeah yeah all right cool totally. yeah oh um actually really quickly on the recording and uh, this is uh, this is a um, a direct ask from my from our from our publicist. Mm-hmm. Um, could we possibly get access to the footage before? Um, I mean, there might be reasons whether it's related to compliance or mm-hmm. you know, whatever Alexa ultimately feels is not necessarily representative or aligned with the brand. Um, you know, we would just prefer if you know we could just see all you know the full footage before or she wants to see the full footage before it ultimately totally yeah oh for sure for sure we can definitely do that we can definitely do that yeah and i think the most of the footage is we're probably going to upload it on a youtube channel that's later going to be posted um either 
on BLCK VC's uh, LinkedIn or all their social media sites, in that, including their website. Mm -hmm. Also, I think what might also be powerful, and by the way, like, you know, feel free to take this um, mm -hmm. suggestion um, or not. Um, even just like cutting like small little, like, I don't know, 10 second clips or something of maybe like mm -hmm. people's responses. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I just think that we live in such a sh short, like, you know, sure. information, you know, attention span. Like, mm -hmm. That's also just really good for Twitter, right? Like, you know, yeah. post one of these vignettes, it gets retweeted, you know, comments, you know, amplification. Totally. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Thanks, we appreciate that suggestion. Yeah, and I and I think to that point, like one thing that we didn't do as much during the last session was essentially gaining feedback from the speakers themselves. Mm -hmm. So as we as we go through this, we'll definitely follow up and love to hear your thoughts on future topics or you know perhaps like phrasing or you know whatever whatever it might be. Um, just yeah. Yeah. Um... Actually, funny enough, I was talking to um, a portfolio company team um, earlier this morning. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, this has just been a recurring topic that I've received from a number of CEOs. But, um, you know, the ease of, you know, entering business, uh, you know, entering into a new market or, you know, starting a new business in each, you know, the 54 or so different countries in Africa, like, mm -hmm. it's just different, right? Um, I mean, some countries are more, you know, I guess, protectionist than others, right? Yeah. So, I mean, for example, you know, and portfolio company is trying to launch right now in Ghana. You know, Ghana has, you know, a regulatory environment where you literally have to deposit like, you know, half a million dollars, you know, in order to be able to actually even do business, um, you know, receive, you know, a, a license to, you know, conduct business as a foreign company. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it would be really interesting at least to learn more about other founders' experiences, um, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's, you know, entering or, or, or even, you know, their experiences like, you know, launching, you know, if they failed, I, I think you learn better from failure actually than actually mm -hmm. success. Like, you know, what were some of the challenges, especially in terms of like, I don't know, Jumia's entry and then exit, you know, in and out of Cameroon, you know, for example, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, and then another one that also just recently came up um, has to do with the intersection of uh, public policy regulation and, mm -hmm. and tech, right? Um, there have been a number of uh, founders, CEOs that I've been speaking to who are basically, you know, suggesting like, you know, is it is now the time, you know, just given the critical mass that the industry is increasingly having, whether it's in countries like Nigeria, Kenya, um, you know, South Africa, you know, to, to effectively create like lobbying groups, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to aggregate their, you know, their wow. shared experiences, their, you know, call it their, you know, their desire to have, you know, a clear and more refined regulatory environment, like, you know, mm -hmm. and I mean, it, it would be really interesting at least also just to hear people's experiences. I mean, the good, the bad, and the ugly of like, mm -hmm. you know, how, you know, regulation can truly impact outcomes, you know, for businesses, right? Like I'm thinking of, I don't know, the founders of like Max NG and Gokata, right? Like, and you know, how, you know, the Lagos state government came on that, came down on them at like a ton of bricks, right? You know? Yeah, um, yeah. You know, versus, you know, other countries, um, you know, whether it's like Rwanda, you know, that seems to have public policy that's a lot more- Lenient. You know, friendly, predictable, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, understand like the full spectrum of how, you know, regulation can ultimately be a tailwind or, or headwind, right? Or oh, headwind, yeah. Yeah, I actually know, I was actually thinking of that, honestly, and um, I was thinking of writing that, so maybe like a, no second round of this, but a third mm -hmm. round of our, you know, conversations about investing in Africa, you know, like, and I was thinking about the top uh, title, mm -hmm. maybe like call it like uh, uh, African government's friend or foe, exploring the roles that government mm -hmm. play. So like, um, yeah, but that, that yeah. was brilliant. And I guarantee you, you'll probably get like at least one government official that you could probably, you know, speak totally. at like on their perspective. Oh. Some are from the CBN, oh, yeah. will they come? Hands oh, down. yeah. I, I actually know, <laughs> actually know <laughs> one of my, um, one of my dad's uh, high school classmates is an uh, mm -hmm. executive director in the CBN. Yeah. Uh, Central Bank of Nigeria. So I spoke with him two days ago. I was going to invite him for this, but then I forgot, unfortunately, because um, he also had a, he had um, a talk today, so that time conflict as well. Um, but yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, and I'll 
honestly, I think one thing that maybe we're struggling with on our end is kind of um, like connections. So like getting people in those places to want to speak. Cause I, I know we reached out to some people who thought that they didn't, they weren't in the capacity for some reason, they didn't disclose to us to speak on conversations. Uh, I mean, maybe we just go to do conferences because I mean, they take time, like, <laughs> right, yeah. Like, I mean, especially if like, you're not flying them out somewhere, putting them up in a hotel, everybody's just like, <laughs> but, you know um, yeah <laughs> but um no i mean i think you know the, the momentum that you guys are gaining um in terms of you know these series i think that would change people's minds right um you know i, I like the format not to mention you know the ease of doing this because you know mm -hmm. uh, of, of zoom and everything so I mean, this could quite easily become you know call it you know a um you know, almost like a, you know, a mini version of like a TEDx, you know, a panel style or, or Chatham house rules, you know, mm -hmm. sort of thing, um, mm -hmm. you know, narrowly focused on tech, right? So. Mm -hmm. For sure, for sure. I thank you. Thank you for your kind words. Yeah, my pleasure. Do you know where everybody else is dialing in from, by the way? Uh, I know, uh, um, she's, I think she's dialing in Rebecca might be on the continent actually. Okay. Um, while um, Benga is in San Francisco. The other two, I believe, are in San Francisco or based in, yeah, San Francisco. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's just hope the internet connection, you know, from the continent stays solid. Totally. Yeah. yeah we, we had some issues of that, I think, last time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Hey, totally. Um, uh -huh. I think it was not um, Maya. I hope no, it wasn't no, Maya. Maya. Okay. It was um, cheat, 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 I forget his name. He's also involved in Flutter Wave. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think he he um, he tuned in kind of late because of connection issues. Mm -hmm. So basically, I think it was uh, like our supply back home. You know, you know how it is. It's it's choppy. So mm -hmm. yeah. By the way, I'm, I'm curious. Um, I'm just going through the slides really quickly. Mm -hmm. I know one of the conversations that I've had privately with people is, um, uh, I mean, you know, connected to the entire you know topic of you know startup neocolonialism. Is it problematic mm -hmm. that a lot of you know African startups are actually, you know, technically speaking, you know, U.S. Delaware C corps? So, <laughs> I mean, I have a perspective. Um, <laughs> more than happy to share. Yeah. Um, oh, I would. I would love you to. And it was something I was thinking about because of the problem of like capital flight. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I, I wanted to include it here, um, but because capital flight is kind of like a technical term that I myself don't fully understand. I mm -hmm. just looked. I just called it um, loss of capital of taxable capital gains um, for like no, public no, sector. That's exactly spot on, right? Like. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, if, if your company is ultimately domiciled, um, you know, off continent, mm -hmm. um, it is not as easy for you to ultimately, I mean, on an individual basis, it is, but not on, um, not on a corporate level. Corporate level. Uh, and even on an individual basis, I mean, I, I can find creative ways to, you know, avoid. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Rebecca. Kalada, if you can go to the first slide, I'm going to go ahead and start the webinar up. To let people sure thing know. cool cool sure thing all right hi rebecca yes. um your name uh, i think she's muted oh, you're on mute, yeah and your name might say collade right now oh she, oh yes i think she's my, I gave her my link. Sorry. Hey Hello, everyone, welcome thanks. everyone. Oh, sorry. You got it. <laughs> thanks, bro. Thanks. Uh, thank, thank you all for being here. Um, we're going to wait a few more minutes. 
for the rest of our panelists to uh, uh, join the call. Sorry. All right, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm I just put a question in the chat. It'd be awesome to see where folks are calling in from, just to kind of get a temperature of where we're at in the world. Awesome New York in the house. Florida, Seattle, SF. Morocco, Berlin. We got a global community today. This is awesome. So I think we'll give it maybe three to five more minutes and then we'll just go ahead and get started. Hey, sorry about that. I had to send an email to one of the speakers. She did not get the link, unfortunately, but she should be tuning in soon. But while we wait for her, we do thank you all for being here. And also, um, to those celebrating today, happy Eid Mubarak, and we hope you had a lovely day today. Oh, damn. This keeps happening. Okay, we're just going to wait for a few more minutes to see if Mr. Binger will be joining us. Um, but if not, we'll get started in about a minute.
So we're going to go ahead and get started. Unfortunately, uh, Mr. Benga might not have received the link, but we're going to send him a new one and hope he can join us later on the call. Hi, my name is Kolade Adirli, and today we're going to be talking about the second session discussing this topic called Startup Neocolonialism, Exploring the Bias of Venture Capital Investment on the African Continent. And my co-moderator today would be... Hello, everyone. I'm Ibrahim Balde. Um here as well with Kalade, and we're very, very grateful on behalf of Black VC to have you all here with us. As I mentioned before, it's a global community here, and it's really exciting to have you all in this space. Um, so Black VC is a nonprofit organization that equips Black investors with access, education, and community that they need to accelerate their careers in venture capital. Today, we're hoping to highlight three major aspects. Um, first and foremost, some of the issues facing indigenous founders on the African startup ecosystem, um, address the major source of wealth that startups can create for private individuals on the continent, and somehow touch on some of the aspects of taxable capital gains from the public sector, government, and policy. Before we do so, we kind of want to highlight and take a look back at some of the statistics um, of 2020. Um, year on year growth of the number of startups funded um, last year increased 27%. Year on year growth of total funding increased about 42.7%. And the growth in number of investors in Africa increased about 68.4%. In comparison today, there was about 630 million raised by African startups in only in Q1 of 2021. In comparison to last year's Q1, this represents a 73% increase in, um, in growth for uh, deals. This, is, or this correlates to about 216 investors um, that participated in one or more deals within the continent of Africa. And so with this context, um, we'd like to give the different panelists the opportunity to share a couple sentences about themselves, their background. And I think the key question would be, when you're not working within the investment space, what do you do for fun? And uh, starting with you, Liwon. Thanks so much, Ibrahim. I'm glad I get to go first, uh, trying to think of what exactly I do for fun. Um, but hi, everyone. Nice to meet you. I'm Luam Kafala. I'm Village Capital's investment director, where I lead our firm's early stage investment strategy uh, globally, and obviously that includes Africa. I am ethnically Eritrean, but I was born and raised in Nairobi, Kenya, so kind of have two homes. Um, and for fun, outside of work, I like to go on ridiculously long walks, um, and I like to write. So those are my two. <laughs> those are my two hobbies. Awesome! Awesome! Thank you. And so next up, uh, we have Rebecca. Hi, I'm Rebecca Anonchong. And um, so I have lots and lots of hats. So I don't have a lot of time. I have fun doing everything I do. So I don't, I don't um, do a lot um, outside of, um, except for sometimes drink some nice champagne. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, so yeah, so that's, um, but I have lots of hats and I, I think some of them are, are on screen. I'm um, an entrepreneur myself. I started a company about 20, almost 22 years ago called AppStack. We do enterprise software. Um, I also chair an organization called AfroLabs, um, which is a network of tech hubs across the African continent. I'm um, co-founder and vice president of ABAN, which is the African Business Angels Network. And so, Several other hats, but I think that's enough for now. Awesome, thank you. And lastly, Tony. Hi, everyone. Uh, so, um, yeah, my name is uh, Lua Tony Campbell. I go by Tony for short. Uh, I was born and raised in Nigeria, moved to the United States when I was relatively young. Um, I'm currently uh, the founding partner of Kimpo Venture Capital, uh, which is a brand new early stage uh, Africa focused, or even more specifically, Africa only um, venture fund. Um, I guess what was the next question now? Uh, what do I like to do for fun? Um, so I'm a passionate, passionate uh, collector of art. Um, I, was, I was fortunate enough to actually be born uh, to a father who is a painter. 
I got zero, literally zero of his talent. Um, but with that, uh, though, um, you know, I still exercise that passion by, you know, collecting art and not to mention trying to support artists, um, you, know, um, you know, throughout the continent. That's awesome. Thank you, Tony. Before I hand it off back to Kalade, um, I just wanted to talk about some of the formalities of the uh, conversation. So if you have questions, please put it in the Q&A box at the bottom right of your screen. And we'll try to address as much as possible um, and leave room for questions to be answered. And lastly, um, we'll be following up with the survey. Um, we'd love to hear your thoughts on future topics, future speakers, and feedback on how we can make this a more dynamic and uh, better conversation in the future. So with that being said, I'll hand it over to Kalade to start getting into some of these questions. Thank you, Ibrahim. And you know, when doing our research for this, we decided to categorize the areas that we'd like to discuss today on the three buckets. The first is race, second is language in terms of the languages spoken on the continent in Africa. And the last but not the least was gender. Um, so getting straight to it, we found that the data suggests that a white founder based in the US is, sorry, a white founder based in Kenya is 47,000% more likely to be funded in Kenya than in the US. And to make matters more disheartening, 10% of founders, 10% of funding in East Africa went to local founders. And this is, inequitable suggesting the, um, the population in Africa. So the question we have for our panelists today, I would like to first address this to Rebecca. You know, it's been argued that the cost of, in a, of this inequitable uh, investment allocation is on racial bias. Do you, do you agree with that assessment? If not, what would you say is the cause? I think that it definitely has um, a role um, in what's happening. Obviously, we can't, we can't pretend that race doesn't matter. It matters not just in Africa, but it matters um, in the US, it matters across the world. We've seen disparity between equal projects and how they get funded, um, depending on the race of the founder. Um, and it's, it's very frustrating um, from the point of view of an African entrepreneur, because you have, um, Foreign, foreigners that come into the space. Um, and I'm, we're not saying that they're not talented and they don't have good projects, but you'll have them be able to raise funding very rapidly. Um, and that's funding that's not going to the local founders. And then, so they have all these funds to compete against the local founders um, that aren't, don't have the funds. And I think that's the most frustrating thing is that it's not just that, um, you know, foreigners are getting funding, but they're getting funding to compete against local entrepreneurs. And I think that's the worst, the worst part of it. Uh, uh, do, do, does any of the uh, panelists would like to chime in? No, I, look, I completely agree with everything that Rebecca has said. I, I think one thing I would also like to add on, that, on this topic is um, when it comes to bias, most of the bias operates, you know, rather implicitly. Um, you know, I've been a career investor now, basically my entire career. And the one thing that has kind of been this fascinating paradox to me is that, uh, you know, the venture capital industry, for the most part, prides itself on being very risk taking. Um, but then in reality, when you actually see, you know, the decision making, it tends to actually be very risk averse. Um, you know, investors themselves pride, you know, themselves on, you know, pattern recognition, you know, going for sure bets. And when you have an industry basically, you know, since inception, you know, going back to, you know, the 1960s, 1970s, you know, when, you know, Kleiner, Perkins, Sequoia and the rest were founded. And, you know, the, the success stories, you know, oftentimes look the same. It's disproportionately, you know, white, male, you know, often with technical backgrounds, largely from Northern California, when that becomes the predominant mode of what success looks like, it influences the way that we ultimately look at, you know, the potential of founders, whether they are based in the United States and are of color or are or, 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 or not men, um, or whether it's outside the United States or elsewhere in the world, you know, whether they are African, whether they are black or, or anything else in between. Um, so, I think fundamentally, in order for us to actually think about how we can address racial bias, it needs to start also by 
you know, investors, you know, even individuals like myself, you know, constantly reassessing, you know, are we ultimately overfitting the data, uh, you know, based on, you know, prior historical track records and not giving, you know, the ample level of, of diligence, of time, of, of just, you know, latitude, you know, for founders that we're just fundamentally unfamiliar with, um, but also might still be able to build, you know, truly transformative businesses. Well, thank you for that. And that is actually the perfect transition to our second question we have for today. And I'd like to pose it to Loam. Um, what do you think foreign investors can do to limit their bias? Yeah, this is a, it's a tricky question. I, I don't know that there's any quick fix here, um, but I think that one of, one of the major things is understanding that um, the people that experience the problem are usually best placed to fix it. Um, and locals will understand the problem pretty much better than anybody else. I think to Tony's point, there is this sort of level of looking for security um, in this early stage venture uh, risk taking process, people are looking for security. So uh, to what Tony was saying, like they're looking to, to sort of replicate what they've seen before. Um, and it's different, especially when you're looking at a market that has sort of a different population exporting the bias that you have on what should look like a successful founder and placing it into a market, especially if you don't know the market, is not a recipe for success, in my opinion. Um, I think one of the things that a lot of people have to realize is lived experience is really important in entrepreneurship. And in Africa, operating in Africa and building a company in Africa is really, really difficult. It's a high friction environment. Um, so people who know, live there and understand the problem um, are probably best placed to build a successful solution to it. So I, I, yeah, I definitely think giving weight to lived experience is probably the first thing that I would, I would advise for investors to do. Well, that's amazing. And actually uh, it reminds me of an answer, um, a previous um, panelist we had in the second round gave about, you know, um, the grit that local founders have when compared to expat founders. So then moving on to our second um, topic for today, we're looking at language. So we noticed that most, the top five funding countries are English speaking nations, but you know, French speaking nations are I believe 29, 29 African countries out of 54 are French speaking nations. So why do you think English speaking nations receive most of the funding and how does, or in your experience, how does this difference in funding um, affect diverse funding teams where they speak multiple languages? And how would you recommend teams address that? Oh, I would like to pose that question to Rebecca, yeah. Yeah, being um, in a primarily um, Francophone country, even though we have the advantage of of having both languages here, um, both official languages, although it's a French speaking side and then an English speaking side. So it's not that both speak both languages. Um, although we were probably more bilingual than, than most, most countries and it's, and it's an advantage for us. Um, there's definitely one thing that, that really investors need to understand is that it's a very different business culture um, from the Francophone side to the Anglophone side, I can't speak for the um, phone or um, the Spanish speaking um, country, but it's, it's a very different business culture. And what I've found are that um, entrepreneurs in the French speaking countries are, it's a much more formal process. And so you have entrepreneurs that will have registered their business and they have this like 30 page business plan, um, very detailed, very methodical, but they don't have a product. <laughs> so, and so, and then you have, you know, on the English speaking side, you'll have people that will have the, the product, um, but then they're like, we'll worry about the paperwork later, you know? So it's just a very different approach. Um, and, um, you know, I think a balance of the two is, is what's best, but, you know, one other thing to really understand are that the business laws are very, very different. We've had um, um, entrepreneurs or startups that have wanted to um, open, uh, scale out into some French-speaking countries, and they they make the same mistakes 
that 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 you know many make, which is you go and hire a lawyer because you are used to the lawyer having to register the company and things like that. Whereas in the French speaking countries, you're actually going to what's called a notaire. Um, which is a very different, you know, so you're, you're, you're going to end up spending the money twice. Um, there's so many more restrictions. Everything is so very structured and there's lots of paperwork. But one benefit is that you have 16, I think maybe 17 countries now that are part of one um, business law um, um, organization called uh, OHADA. And um, the, this, the, the OHARA law is all of the business laws, the, from the business registration to um, commercial disputes um, to um, the accounting system. So the accounting system, like, you know, where, where you sell on the English, on the um, Anglo-Saxon side, you know, you create your QuickBooks or whatever, you don't have to pick specific numbers. Well, here they're mandated. Right, they're mandated as part of this OHADA law, um, and then at the end, um, there's a single court that's in Abidjan for all business disputes. So at least, you know, if you if you can manage to understand and to scale into one of the uh, francophone countries, it's much easier than to scale out into into the others because the the business laws and the accounting system is identical. Oh, that's perfect. And um, I'd actually like to ask the investors, Tony, and a um, uh, follow-up question from that. And it is, you know, having heard that there are different restrictions and registrations, you know, between uh, French-speaking nations and um, English-speaking nations and other um, languages that are spoken in Africa, how do you factor that in terms of risk when due diligence and deals on the continent of Africa? I, mean, I guess I can quickly take it. Um, I mean, in terms of risk, um, I mean, I, I can only really speak for myself and you know my own and you know my my partner's um, individual risk tolerance. But you know, a country ultimately operating in Francophone Africa, you know, to us, um, you know, just by virtue of it being a non-English speaking country, I don't we don't necessarily you know quantify that being a you know a more risky business. Um, I think the risks that, you know, we sometimes, you know, and that is, you know, typically without, you know, prior, you know, research or, 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 or investigation or, or even, you know, just hearing, for example, you know, the, the direct anecdotes that, you know, Rebecca, you know, referenced, right? Um, you know, a lot of investors are, are comfortable, familiar operating in English speaking countries, you know, for two reasons. I mean, first, the ease of, of, of language, right? I mean, venture capital is disproportionately an English speaking community so far. Uh, you know, globally. Um, but then second, when it comes to, you know, the legal tradition of, 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 of the English speaking countries relative to the French ones, like that's just more familiar, right? You know, you have, you know, countries like Nigeria, South Africa, Ghana, you have common law, you know, traditions, which means that the legal systems are based off precedent, right? So, you know, if there's a pre-existing precedent, you know, you know, of a similar, you know, you know commercial dispute or transaction or whatever, you can comfortably rely on that, you know, if there is any type of litigation, right? So like, you know, from a legal risk perspective, there's like a little bit more comfort and familiarity with that framework. You know, whereas in Francophone Africa, you know, I mean, quite frankly, I, I wanna be careful what I say because I'm by no means an expert, you know, in this, I mean, this is what we hire lawyers for, but, you know, the uh, Francophone speaking countries are coming from a civil code, you know, system. And, at least my understanding looking at, you know, the French civil code system, you know, using that as my own frame of reference, right? It, it tends to operate in a very bureaucratic, oftentimes very legalistic way. Um, and that can be potentially risky, especially when you're dealing in industries that are highly regulated, highly protected, whether it's financial services, whether, I mean, whether it's healthcare, you know, for example, education, um, you know, the the flexibility of the legal code where if you are innovating in a space where there are, are no laws, right? In an English speaking or common law jurisdiction, basically, you know, depending on the jurisdiction, you know, benefit basically goes to the innovator, right? As long as you can demonstrate that there is a precedent that is close enough that gives you at least some kind of cover. I don't necessarily know if that's the same way when it comes to the Francophone speaking countries. Like if there's no law that pre-exists that allows you to do X, Y, and Z, 
you know, my understanding is that like you can be completely, you know, shut down. So like that's the biggest risk I think we personally try to assess, but it's not really, it doesn't really have anything to do with language. And it doesn't have anything to do with the, you know, the massive market opportunity, the ease of, you know, potentially doing business once you're plugged in. Um, but the larger questions that we're still trying to parse through are, you know, how do we get a better understanding and familiarity with when things go wrong? You know, whether, you know, uh, you know, there's a regulatory, a shift in a regulatory environment, you know, commercial disputes, you know, et cetera, and how do we ultimately handle and, and, and mitigate that you know, alongside, you know, our, um, you know, our portfolio company, you know, leaders. Thank you. Uh, Lauren, do you have anything to chime in on this? Yeah, um, I'm actually like super excited by the potential of Franco in Africa going forward to some of the points Rebecca made. Uh, I, I really think that there's, there's just a lot of potential even in some of the things being standardized because the friction moving from one country to another country in Africa is very real. Uh, so if some of that is mitigated, I, I, I honestly think that would make it a huge market opportunity. In terms of where capital is flowing currently, I think one of the things we sort of have to remember is, is these venture ecosystems, the startup ecosystem being developed is still fairly nascent. And we live in a very uh, fragmented, I don't even, I don't even call it a, a singular market. It's, it's a cluster of 55. Um, so there's capital that's being concentrated in certain locations that I, I honestly think is also then uh, becomes a sense of security for investors. So then they tend to concentrate in those locations rather than uh, taking a bigger risk and moving to a market where there aren't that many peers. Um, but I think as the capital uh, stack continues to grow in that market, that a lot of that potential will start to come into fruition and there will be a lot more capital moving into um, markets like uh, Francophone countries, which I 100% think there should be more of. So we'll be reaching out to Rebecca. Thank you, and I appreciate that. I'm glad uh, that connection could be made on this call. So moving on, we'd like to address gender. So this data point, I was reading an article the other day, it's um, quite disappointing. It states that, you know, like between 2020 and 2019, the amount of funding, the percentage of total funding in Africa that went to female CEOs dropped by 50% from 4% to 2%. And um, Rebecca, um, I know I've been addressing you a lot, but um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this and also Lauren as well. Wow, I mean, I, I think that this is, again, this is not an African story. Um, you know, we, we, there was a, there's the, the uh, I think it's called the Diane Report, which um, does a survey, um, does an analysis of all of the black women in the world that have raised over a million dollars. And there were so few of them that they were, they, were, they were able to get them into a room and take a picture of them. And I think they were under 30 um, a couple of years ago. It's changing a little bit, but um, black women are just not getting funded. Um, it's, 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 you know, I, I see a lot of entrepreneurs um, that are women that have, um, great projects, they just not taken seriously. Um, and it's, it's hard. And it's hard to get women um, sometimes to um, get out there. Because um, some, sometimes we feel like we're not good enough, we're not ready enough, right? So you'll have the male entrepreneur that's totally not ready, but they'll go out and try to start getting some funding. Whereas the woman will generally wait until everything is right and everything is perfect. Um, but I'm very proud um, to be involved in a number of organizations and startups where women are at the top and running the, the, the companies or running the organizations. And I think that, that more and more we need to see success stories with women um, and that will change the narrative um, because right now success looks like white male. And um, the more we see black women um, making it, um, the more it normalizes it and the less of a bias we'll, we'll see. Thank you, thank you all. Noam, do you have anything to add on to that? 
I, I mean, I completely agree with what Rebecca said. I, I do think that a lot of it is that women are not necessarily uh, taken, probably taken as seriously. There, there is a report that um, I, th I thought was fascinating where they looked at how uh, women pitched and then uh, men pitched and with men there was a focus on like the potential of the company but with women there was a focus on mitigating risk um so i think it's even just the way that women are perceived that is uh incorrect and terrible uh that there needs to be a shift in perception i think in terms of what sort of problem it is or what can be done to mitigate it or fix it i do think a big part of it is actually also having more women investors, more African women investors on the capital side uh, to be able to find and invest and recognize the potential in fellow African women entrepreneurs. Because I think that the bias that exists um, is inherent and is tough to sort of overthrow. But I think if you're meaningfully placing um, more African women in decision-making capacities, at investment funds, we will definitely see more African entrepreneurs, uh, African female entrepreneurs getting funded. Oh, thank you, and that's actually really brilliant. And um, I'd like to real quickly uh, give a kind of a shout out to like First Check Africa. I think that's their mission. They give, uh, they try to be the first dollar into um, female founded uh, startups on the continent of Africa. And one of the one of the founders of the program or doing IO or when he was actually a speaker on the panel of our last event. So I'd just like to say um, thank you for doing what you do. Yeah, they're doing amazing work. I'm a huge fan of Odenayo. She's a portfolio company of ours too. Oh, nice. That's great. That's great. So Tony, my question to you is going to be phrased differently from what's on the screen. So Africa, the continent of Africa is a very patriarchal society. And, you know, we've learned from what Noam and Rebecca has said that, you know, a lot of this perception is as a result of you know how people view women and i for one believe that it's a lot different on the continent of africa and that might affect the operations or how women run businesses you know it's it just adds a, additional friction to how women do operate businesses on the continent as opposed to everywhere else um what are your thoughts on that and how can this bias be solved no, I, I think that's a fantastic point. I mean, yes, there there are cultural legacies that exist, not only in African societies, but I would actually say globally in terms of, you know, I would say, you know, the inherent, you know, male bias or the assumptions of, of, um, of you know, call it male authority, um, especially in, in, in corporate spaces. Um, you know, with that being said, I think, you know, the most powerful way that we can ultimately do that is, I mean, well, two ways. Uh, first, I think the challenges are far beyond just even funding, you know, from a venture capital perspective. You know, one of the priorities that, you know, my partner, you know, Jay and I have made is even just beyond supporting, you know, um, you know female founders, female CEOs. Uh, we want to also encourage all of our portfolio companies to consistently report, you know, measure, track, uh, you know, their, their gender, you know, ratios across all, you know, you know, um, you know departments. Um, that's the only way that we think that um, you know, systematic, systematic change can ultimately, you know, happen, right? It, it, it begins at the top, but I think it ultimately percolates all the way down through, our, you know, down, you know, all corporate hierarchies, whether from the smallest startup all the way to the largest organizations. Um, so as, as we can ultimately increase the di diversity um, on, on the dimension of gender, you know, across our organizations, then perhaps we'll be able to actually start beginning to shift that perception or that assumption that, only male voices, only men, only men can ultimately be corporate leaders. Um, and then, you know, I think the second thing that I think is also really powerful or potentially can be powerful is um, we just need more men, you know, to ultimately be allies, um, you know, to, to women, um, especially in the workforce. Um, you know, I, I think there's oftentimes um, uh, a tendency, you know, whether it's, um, you know, implicit or explicit that, you know, men just want to, you know, congregate with each other. Um, you know, the, the instinct that, you know, a senior executive has is to ultimately try to, you know, mentor, you know, someone that reminds themselves, um, you know, or reminds them of themselves, right? And, you know, if you have male leaders at the top, they're most likely ultimately going to, you know, put, you know, young men under their wings. You know, I think men, especially men in position of power, need to begin to, you know, start unlearning that tendency. Um, you know, to actually say, you know what, I have a responsibility, you know, given the leadership, given the authority that I have, 
you know, to create a more inclusive workforce and, you know, in, in tandem with society, I need to step in and actually say, I want to mentor women. I want to provide those opportunities to, you know, women that have, you know, that strong potential in the same way that, you know, it has historically been done, you know, for men, you know, not only, you know, in the African corporate world, but, you know, just frankly, globally. So, I mean, it boils down to two things. I mean, first, uh, you can only manage what you measure. Um, so I think all companies themselves should be consistently you know, tracking what does the you know, gender breakdown of, of their companies on a high level, also on a, on a department level look like. And then second, you know, the leaders of these organizations, these business units need to also step in and say, how do I ultimately empower you know, the women within, you know, um, within my teams or within their teams um, you know, to rise up, um, you know, to have those opportunities to ultimately shine in the same way that men historically have. Oh, thank you. That was excellent. And um, it's actually almost a, a perfect segue to our next um, topic. So we're going to shift our mindset from thinking about the problems and the areas to start thinking about the solutions. And now I'm, um, I'm going to address this question to you because I got some of the quotes here from a uh, village capital essay, um, you know, some of the problems could be associated with the lack of a black capital stack. So what that means is a black um, limited partner, it, whether it is a limited partner in a venture capital fund or a limited partner in a startup. Um, do you think that's the problem and how can that problem be solved? But the second question is what I would really love to hear your thoughts on. Some people have said that a potential solution to BAS is a peer selected investment process. And what that means is that you give the power of the investment decision-making process to people on the ground, people closer to the problem. So you have female founders on the ground, you know, female corporate leaders or black female corporate leaders to be more specific to solve the gender problem. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And do you think, how can that be implemented on the continent? Yeah, so I, I will answer the peer selected piece and then I'll answer the other question because um, I think that that's a super important point too. So on the peer selection piece, uh, yeah, so we've tried it, we've we've done it and we've done it successfully um, for almost nine or 10 years now. Um, and it's been pretty meaningful in finding uh, great entrepreneurs that are local um, I, I don't think it's completely perfect as a process, but nothing is. Um, but it has been really, really great in identifying strong, high potential entrepreneurs. Uh, on the on the issue of uh, the black capital stack, uh, I agree. I do think there needs to be a lot more African uh, investors and African decision makers, African fund managers as well. The other thing that I've actually been recently obsessing over and, and wrote about um, for our newsletter, the Africa Playbook last month was local capital and local capital that's available. So um, in pension funds and other sort of institutions, the long-term deferred savings in a lot of African countries is actually quite a bit of money. Like in Uganda alone, I think it's about 4 billion, um, but most of it is actually allocated towards um, government bonds. So it's not invested into venture funds. It's not invested into private equity funds. It's not invested into public markets uh, significantly. It's invested largely in government bonds because they're relatively low risk and they yield a, a, a decent return. So I think there needs to be a lot more of a mind shift locally because there is a lot of local capital available towards moving those funds into private equity funds or venture funds, or even the public markets to be able to facilitate innovate, uh, entrepreneurship more meaningfully. I'm excited about the prospect of us getting to a, a place eventually where um, our local institutionals end up being the critical LPs in many of the local venture funds and private equity funds, because I really think that could contribute meaningfully to our ecosystem and create a lot of economic growth locally on a country by country basis. And so I, I definitely think that's a huge and important piece of it. Now the urgency in which things will move there still a little up in the air, but uh, I think the prospect of that is, is extremely exciting. Well, thank you. And I do have to apologize. I'm also taking notes because you all are saying some really brilliant points that I'm learning from. I would actually like to continue that before I move on to Rebecca, I would like to continue that by asking. So you mentioned, you know, um, utilizing local funds, but how can 
the venture world or the African tech ecosystem utilize Africans in diaspora to our sources of funding on liquidity? Uh, yeah, do you, Rebecca, do you want to say something to that? Oh, is it? Oh, wait, are you asking me? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. I, thought you were, I thought you said before you were going to ask me. Um, yeah, but I, I'd actually like to get back and finish and, and also add something to the previous question. I think it's super important um, that we start, that Africans start investing in Africa. I think that, um, you know, un until we start investing in our in our entrepreneurs and our startups, we'll, we'll, we'll start, we'll be complaining about, um, you know, bias, you know, for the next 50 years, because I, we can't force, uh, you know, Americans or Europeans to invest their hard earned money into our startups, if we're not doing it. And I think that's one of the reasons that we created ABAN, which is the African Business Angels Network, which is really to promote and support early stage investment on the um, African continent and, and provide the tools and the skills to um, potential investors um, and help them create networks um, and then help them become better investors. Um, so that, that's really what the purpose of the organization is. And so in partnership with Afrolabs, which I mentioned um, in my introduction, which is a network of um, tech hubs, we have um, 268 hubs now across 49 countries um, and supporting a community of about a million entrepreneurs. And so we're, we're trying, we created a joint program between ABAN and Afrolabs really to support early stage investment from Africans to Africans. Um, and what, what we're doing in this program is that a startup that's in an Afrolabs hub gets an investment by an angel investor that's in an ABAN network. And this program, which we call Catalytic Africa, will match that investment. And we match it as a grant um, to the startup. We, this is structurally the only way we could do it is we're both nonprofit organizations. But um, the idea is to really support angel investment um, and to help angel investors have their money go further um, to help angel investors. Um, it helps de-risk a little bit because there's a hub that's supporting on the other side and it really strengthens those linkages between different, different people in the ecosystem, different components in the ecosystem. So you have the hubs and the startups and the angel investors and the angel groups and to start to really structure those relationships um, and then see. So that's a program that we just we're just in the process of starting. We've raised um, about one and a half million uh, euro for the matching fund, um, and we're going to start um, raising some more money for this fund. And um, so it's it's. But we'll start. We're starting the the program. You know, incessantly within the next couple of weeks, um, um, we'll 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 have at least one one transaction. Um, and hoping to do um, the, this over two years, the, the rest of the transaction. So I think that's just one, one idea um, to sort of really support angel investment um, and to promote angel investment on, on the continent because a lot of people are investing, but they don't know that it's called angel investing. And you know, we've done so much work over the last few years with entrepreneurs teaching them about term sheets and valuation and due diligence, but we're not doing the same on the investment side. And so you have these you know, um, high net worth individuals that have money, but are sometimes a little intimidated even by the process of investment because you've got this entrepreneur in front of you that's like, yeah, you know, and, and you don't have the tools. And so we're really trying to provide those tools and, and create lots and lots and lots of angel investors across the continent. Because another issue is, you know, you always hear those stories in Silicon Valley about, oh, I went to 100, I went to 100 investors and it was the 101st that invested in me, right? Well, in Africa, we don't have 101s. Like if you don't get, 
to the first four or five angel investors in your country, you're, you're done. <laughs> so um, we really want to get to that 100 or 200 in each country um, so that, um, so that you know, entrepreneurs have an opportunity to get investment from local investors um, yeah, that better understand their ecosystem. Well, thank you. That was brilliant. Uh, but that was uh, not so your question. And I can't remember what the question was. <laughs> No, no, no. That was actually part of my question. That was the first part of my question. The second part of my question was with regards to how we can utilize the diaspora, Africans in the diaspora, to um, basically provide uh, financing to, um, to you know, early stage investments, whether that's equity financing or debt or even um, revenue based financing or bottom line financing. Yeah, I think there are some uh, mechanisms now. There's the Diaspora Invest uh, uh, Angels Network um, that was set up and is a member of ABAN. Um, and so again, I think a lot of it will have to do with co-investments. Um, it's just, you know, it, it's it finding local investors and do co-investment um, because it's so hard when you're on, you know, a way to do the due diligence, to follow up with the startup, to work hand in hand with them. I think COVID has been a great equalizer for many um, because you know you 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 don't you you don't have to have that coffee meetings the over coffee um, restrictions. Everything is happening over um, Zoom, um, and so I think that it's helped to balance things out. Um, and so even diaspora um, angel investors from the diaspora are better able to interact with um, in, um, entrepreneurs on, on the continent. Um, yeah, without feeling like oh, but we haven't met. <laughs> it's now normal. Nice, nice. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to move to the last set of questions and we're looking forward, you know, the African East Coast system is growing at a rapid rate. And um, just, we, just so we can leave questions for the audience, I'd like to ask the three of you maybe in a sentence or less, a sentence or two, um, could you state what you're optimistic about the ecosystem? What do you look at in the future that makes you very excited for the African ecosystem? Tony, you can start. Great. Um, I, I think the one thing that excites me the most about the African ecosystem, I can't remember exactly where, you know, I read this, but, um, you know, whether it was on Twitter or, you know, a news article, but, you know, you know, a country like Nigeria where, you know, natural resources and in particular oil and gas is just so, you know, dominant in terms of, you know, the economic, you know, importance um, you know, someone wrote, you know, whether it was in a tweet or in an article that, uh, you know, tech is now the new oil, right? And, you know, it made me pause and it made me just at least smile because, you know, I think for the first time, you know, perhaps in, you know, Nigeria's political or and economic history, you know, we have, you know, this, you know, widespread acceptance, if not excitement about you know the power of entrepreneurship not only just you know on a on an individual level like i need to start a business because this is the only way that i need i can make money and ultimately you know take care of my family my kids but you know i now i can actually start a business and have a significant impact not only you know for myself individually but for my community and even potentially for my country um so i think that massive you know that shift that is currently going on not only in countries like nigeria but actually you know frankly across the continent of you know, this eagerness, if not, you know, acceptance of, you know, of the entrepreneurial journey um, is something that really excites me. And I mean, it's, I think we're just in the beginning phases, right? Like, you know, we've already started to see, you know, some of the, you know, the, the early shoots of that, you know, whether it's, you know, companies like, um, you know, Benga's, you know, with Flutterwave, you know, Paystack, you know, and the likes. Um, but, you know, I fully suspect that, you know, the next generation of, you know, tech entrepreneurs are not only going to be building businesses for the continent, but, you know, for the rest of the world. And that's what really excites me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sorry. Uh, I'm looking at my phone because the audience, oh, sorry. I'm jumping ahead of myself. I apologize for that. Noam, could you go next? Yeah, um, I think what probably is encouraging or, or exciting to me is the level of innovation and just innovative business models that people have come up with uh, to build in their communities is just like fascinating and inspiring to me. I, I'm 
a huge advocate of kind of mentioning that like our markets are are different uh, and obviously there's different sort of restrictions there's different infrastructure that exists um, in Africa that probably doesn't exist in other um, more in other markets really uh, there there's sort of a different set of rules so seeing the amount of innovation that people come up with uh, to solve like very significant problems I think is exciting for me and I always say that I feel like in the US and other more developed markets, um, people are building to disrupt the disruption of the disruption. Um, whereas in Africa, I feel like people are building to build like and create new systems. Um, and that is just like super, super exciting to me. Thank you. And honestly, it's right. It's like way in Africa, we're starting from like a blank board. So honestly, the continent is our oyster to make the most out of it. Rebecca? Yeah, so I, I, um, I, I, so it's so exciting to see um, the entrepreneurs and what they come up with. And what I love is that sometimes they create innovation to solve a problem so that they could sell their startup or, or sell their product. But it's, it's that innovation. They don't realize it's innovation. And so, I mean, I, I've seen it so many times when they are having a problem internally um, and they they create they they innovate they create a product to to resolve that problem that has nothing to do with the product that they're putting on the market. And what I what I feel is that because they don't know that this is super innovating, um, they don't realize that this we could sell this. And I think that's our role, you know. That's what we can bring to them and say, hey, by the way, this is amazing. This is incredible. You could sell this to Uber or you could sell it to Google or, you know, so I think, but there's so much going on on the ground, but we cannot underestimate how difficult it is. We can't underestimate, um, you know, the challenges and, you know, the governments that change the rules day in, day out. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to innovate and, you know, being an entrepreneur and running a startup is hard enough, but you're, you're doing it on quicksand. Um, because things evolve every day. And um, so it's really, really difficult. And so a real shout out to the resilience of all African entrepreneurs, because it's, it's beyond difficult um, to, to grow a business. And, you know, when you see people, um, individuals that are able to overcome all of these challenges and still succeed, it, it, it just really, we're, it's, we're proud. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And those were kind of words that, that I also agree with. Um, I'm going to hand the mic now back to Ibrahim to handle the obvious questions. Awesome. So one of the first questions that we have um, is um, to expound on the level of risk on and how they incorporate or how you incorporate risk in your approach um, investment theory. Um, kind of circling back to some of the initial conversations of the of the panel. Um, so I'll, I guess I'll direct this to Liwam and Tony. And I know we're short on time, so maybe like a sentence or two. Uh, yeah, okay, I'll try to be really quick. Um, I, I, I think honestly, the way that you assess risk uh, is more of an art than a science when it's really early stage businesses. Um, I do think lived experience is a huge de-risk uh, de-risking factor for me. And I think why bias is like so uh, especially terrible in early stages because there's just so much uncertainty. Um, so people tend to go to what Tony was saying earlier, when things are uncertain, you tend to go to what feels safe. Um, and so that's why a lot of uh, investors have like these implicit biases. But uh, I think a, a way to counterweight that is, is to put a high premium on lived experience, specifically when we're talking about a high friction environment. Yeah, um, I mean, I think that's a great question. And, you know, I agree with, um, you know, what was said before, um, yeah, risk is, assessing risk is more an art than a science. Um, I think the way that I typically think of it is, um, you know, there are probably four main buckets that I'm trying to understand anytime I'm actively diligencing an investment opportunity. You know, the first, force and foremost is, you know, the founder and their ability to execute, right? Um, you know, I, I think that is, 
that is the number one risk that you know we as investors are trying to assess like you know can this person ultimately deliver on the vision that they've um, you know that they're pitching um, you know beyond that I would say there is a technical risk or even just more broadly product risk right like you know can is the product um, one that is not only um, that that fits the market but can consistently you know can be augmented you know to not only keep up and to surpass its competitors but also even beyond that you know to to reflect the changes in the underlying market you know i think the third risk also is just like a, a general you know market or even more broadly like you know regulatory risk right so like it's it's uh you know who are the incumbents how are they going to respond you know who are you know the key stakeholders within an, you know, within an ecosystem you know regulators you know etc um and then the last one and this is probably the most nebulous but um you know, in my investing experience so far, this has actually been one of the more profound risks that I wish I did a better job assessing. And it's more of an organizational or if not just like a culture risk. Um, you know, there are a lot of businesses that I would say that, you know, just check the check, you know, they, they check the boxes in terms of high quality founders with like, you know, exceptional domain expertise, you know, great product, you know, great product vision, you know, the market, you know, is, is just there for the taking. But for a myriad of reasons, <laughs> And most of which are just organizational, like people just cannot get along and actually work together as a team, right? So I think you know as much as we like to focus on you know the founder, the product, the market, we also need to you know think critically about you know the risks that are embedded anytime you bring you know large and oftentimes very talented and you know you also want opinionated people in the room. You know how are those dynamics ultimately going to interplay with each other? I mean, will they? You know, become inhibitors to growth, or would they be actually catalysts to growth? Um, so, I mean, I say you know those are the four main vectors of risk. Um, you know, in any investment, you know, um, you know process that I, I'm constantly trying to you know assess. Absolutely, thank you for that. Um, and I know, and just being mindful of time, we're about hitting the hour. I just wanted to give space to kind of close off, so we don't kind of end on this awkward note. But I'll I'll send I'll send it over I send the mic over to you Rebecca to offer our audience any closing words and uh, you know thoughts of encouragement to the community. Well, okay, if you are um, a high net worth individual and on your on this call, please invest in African startups. <laughs> we, we I think you know there's so much innovation that can come from Africa to the world. Uh, we just need to fund it. And um, you know we need to support our our entrepreneurs. Awesome, thank you. Anyone else? Feel free to jump in. Yeah, I guess I'll just uh, quickly say to to Rebecca's point. There's also a lot of uh, diaspora funds um, and diaspora syndicates that are super great if if you want to get involved in in angel investing. Um, I guess in, in, in just wrapping up, I'm just so excited by all the progress that's been made. It's going to be a journey. There's so much more to come. We're still fairly early um, in this ecosystem development, um, but I genuinely believe that we will get to, to a place where this will be um, such a big part of Africa's economic growth story. So I'm excited for all the things that are to come. Yeah, and I guess I'll jump in. Um, I mean, first of all, I'm, you know, hats off to you two guys for putting this together. Um, I think this is a perfect example of what we need to do more of, um, you know, for, you know, for the for the African and in the broader African diaspora, you know, uh, tech ecosystem. Uh, we just need to have more conversations like this, you know, to share our experiences, our insights, um, you know, to, you know, to, you know, better, you know, educate and not to mention, um, you know, inspire and encourage all of us. Um, you know, I think there are a lot of incredible people, you know, around the world, African, non-African, who are doing amazing things, but, you know, they're, they're doing amazing things by themselves, you know, without being plugged into a broader ecosystem, a broader community that can ultimately support them, you know, empower them, you know, guide them, you know, to, you know, to the vision that they ultimately have. So, um, you know, organizations like Black VC, you know, and not to mention, you know, um, you know, sessions like this, like this is, this is an incredible starting point to a lot of, you know, great outcomes. Thank you so much. That's a beautiful note to wrap things up and to the point of more conversations like this, uh, please stay connected with us here at Black VC. We'll be hosting our third session and perhaps we'll be re-inviting some of uh, 
the speakers and you know feel free to connect with them if they're open to LinkedIn and whatnot. But um, at this point, it's the end of our session. I wanna thank you all for joining us on behalf of Black VC, Kalada and myself. Um, yeah, thank you and have a wonderful evening, afternoon, wherever you're at in the world. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.